Okay. Um, could we close the doors, please, and uh, we'll start the session. So, f welcome back, and this is the first of the uh, policy sessions with uh, debate from the floor. Uh, we pioneered this last national conference and it was very well received, so here we go again. Um, I need first to give uh, us all a tutorial. I've received several tutorials and let's hope I'm up to this task on uh, how we do this. So in your lanyards, you have a um, piece of paper with um, QR scans on it. Could you please take those out because you'll need those. Um, instead of getting a, an external device, this, the wonderful world of artificial intelligence means that we can either just, uh, and these two, uh, this piece of paper has got policy session, policy debate session one and session two. We are now in session one. Please don't mix them up. So for session one, you can either scan that uh, code into your phone and you will be on the voting website or you can type in www.menti.com and uh, in your device and you will be on the voting website. After, uh, and if you're typing it in, you've got to put in that code 827448. How are we going? Has everybody got there? Uh, anybody who hasn't got a device, uh, please come to the front left uh, hand side of the room where Karshal is helping people vote who haven't brought a device with them. All right, so uh, while you're doing that, um, <coughs> we'll just, um, I'll just give you the, are we ready to do the test poll? Are enough people online to have a go at this? All right, the motion is that uh, Cats are better pets than dogs, and the draft motion, our AMA advocate for all members to have dogs as pets. And uh, please. How are we going? Let me know when we're all good. All right, well, please cast your vote. And. Uh, We'll allow 30 seconds for people to punch in a yes, no, don't, yes, no, no. Um, and when that time elapses, the result of the ballot will come up. So, okay, voting is closed and um, the result is uh, in favor of dogs. <laughs> All right, are we all happy with, the, with how to do it? We've got the technology right. Now we go to the uh, rules of debate. So we have four uh, uh, de de policy debates for this session and uh, the rules are the proposer will have five minutes to introduce the motion. The seconder uh, has three minutes to speak to the motion if they desire, they have the right to reserve. Subsequent speakers will have made their way to the microphones and uh, they will have three minutes each. Now we don't know how many people want to speak to any one motion, so I'd be very grateful if somebody's already made the contribution you, you were going to make that if you, um, uh, you, you know, conceded your position in the queue because we'd like to get as many views as possible. The maximum debate time for any topic is 30 minutes, so I will have to cut it off at that time. And then the motion will be put, uh, it will vote via the Menti website, and it's a simple majority, um, um, you know, to pass the motion. These motions then go to Federal Council to be uh, considered and to determine in what form they will progress through the Federal Council policy making framework. Oh, good. Okay. Well, look, I welcome to uh, the podium the speakers to the first motion, Dr. Jill Tomlinson, Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave. Thank you, Chair. 
Intimate partner violence is the leading contributor to the preventable death, disability and illness burden in women aged 15 to 45. The AMA position statement on family and domestic violence states that the statistics on the deaths and serious injuries resulting from family and domestic violence has been called a national epidemic and one of Australia's biggest social, legal and health problems. After a victim of family violence is murdered by her partner, people often ask, why didn't she leave? Economic insecurity is one of the most significant obstacles confronting victims of family violence who are seeking to leave a violent relationship. When victims are leaving a violent relationship, they need time and money to physically get away, establish a safe place to live, move their children, establish a safety plan for their personal security, and potentially to attend court hearings. Victims are at greatest risk of homicide at the point of separation, and they need resources and time to mitigate this risk and to remove themselves and their children from abuse. Providing 10 days of paid domestic violence leave to every employee is estimated to cost the equivalent of just five cents per worker per day. Domestic violence already costs workplaces through absenteeism and staff turnover, decreased staff performance and productivity. Domestic violence also costs the community and health system due to the burden of the physical and mental illness and disability that it creates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, are you going to speak to the motion as well? You're the seconder. Thank you, Chair. Domestic violence leave is available to employees at private companies including Qantas, NAB, Westpac, Telstra, IKEA and Woolworths. 10 days of paid domestic violence leave exists in over 1,000 enterprise agreements approved under the Fair, Trade, Fair Work Act in the last two years. Queensland and Western Australia offer 10 days of paid domestic violence leave to public sector employees, while Australia, South Australia offers 15, and in Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory, 20 days of paid leave is available. Internationally, paid domestic violence leave is available to employees in New Zealand, the Philippines and parts of Canada. One Australian woman <clears throat> is murdered a week by her partner. One in four Australian women experience family violence and half of the victims have children in their care. If we wish to tackle this national epidemic and address one of Australia's biggest health problems, we need to help women leave abusive situations by making 10 days of domestic, domestic violence leave the minimum available to all employees. This can be achieved through changes to the national employment standards and advocacy for a minimum of 10 days of paid domestic violence leave to be included in all enterprise agreements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any Member delegates who would like to speak to this uh, motion, could you go to the microphones? Okay, Michael. Maybe I'll start again. I apologise. I was just speaking loudly. So um, I guess my background was that I have been involved in domestic and family violence programs for some time. Uh, it became obvious to me that we weren't doing enough for the people who provide the services in health. They look after the clients and the patients that come through the doors, but we hadn't been doing enough for the, uh, the staff in the public health system, and I'm specifically talking about public health. I was involved with a policy setting group within Queensland and had an opportunity to put forward the domestic and family violence leave arrangements in Queensland which were accepted by the government. Um, I'm now involved in oversighting those in a large health service and I would have to say it's made a significant improvement in the way 
that staff are supported in the organisation and does give them time to attend to all those things that have been identified. So I would speak very, very strongly in favour of the motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Microphone two. My question is, um, is this 10 days in addition to sick leave per annum, or is this 10 days of leave at yes. a time after an acute incident? Um, Family well, and domestic... Reg regrettably, the motion is the motion. Okay. There's no opportunity to, to clarify that issue. All right. Um, OK. It's, unless, Jill, you want to say something on that, is there? Yeah. Well, you've got a quick... Quick, quick... The motion would be for 10 days of paid domestic violence leave under the National Employment Scheme or under uh, negotiated uh, agreements. Um, and there are some agreements that already have 15 or 20, and in that setting it would not be reducing those 15 or 20, but adding to the leave that is not available for individuals who currently don't have it under their awards. Okay. Um, microphone two. Hi, Rebecca Wood from Western Australia. I'd like to speak in support of this draft motion. I think it's a fantastic initiative to bring it all in into each of our enterprise bargaining agreements as soon as we can. Um, I noticed that the draft motion about the paid family and domestic violence leave was something that we had discussed at CDT and had put it into, well, not exactly as you have it, Jill, but um, it was something, it, uh, domestic violence leave is something we did discuss around the CDT table and I don't think that I would be the only DIT who is in support of the motion. Um, I would like to see, obviously it will be fleshed out further at Federal Council, but perhaps just the wording around the 10 days or two weeks, as a lot of us do work more than 10 days in a two week period. Uh, I think it's a fantastic motion, thank you. Thank you. Microphone one. Hello, my name is Gavin, I'm from Victoria, I'm the current chair of the board of AMSA. Um, I rise in support of this particular motion. Um, on a personal level, as a very young boy, watching my mother, who was unable to leave an abusive relationship that she was in, purely on the basis of this financial reason. She was unable to get the leave that was required in order to set up a new house, in order to ensure that she wouldn't lose her job by making the choices that she did. And I, would, and I apologise that it's a very personal reason for me to rise in support of this, but I would like to encourage everybody to continue to support these elements, for people to allow both women and also people affected, as well as the children especially, to be able to rise out of these situations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more speakers? Otherwise, we'll put the motion. Um, OK, so electronic voting. Um, this is now open for voting, I hope. Good. So the motion is that our AMA advocate for all employees to have access to a minimum of 10 days of paid domestic violence leave. So all done? Is that, um, Phil, is that closed off? Okay, so the, um, the result is as seen on your screen, so the motion is carried. Thank you. Um, and just to reiterate, these motions go to Federal Council, so where details are missing from them, as um, one speaker w was looking for, the, it, this is the start of the policy development, not, not the end. Okay, uh, topic number two, should all GP registrars be employed under single employer contracts? Dr McMullen. And Josephine. Thanks, Bev. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a GP in Sydney and not all that long ago was a GP registrar, so hopefully today can help bridge the gap and help us as a profession find a way to support our GP Trainee, trainees and registrars and therefore strengthening our profession as a whole. I'm here today to ask you to open your minds to a different model of training, although though for those of you in hospital specialties it may sound rather familiar. I'll open with some questions to set the scene. 
Do you think it's fair that some specialty registrars get access to maternity leave while others don't? Do you think it's reasonable to never have more than two and a half days of sick leave accrued? Do you think it's fair for, that one, for one person to be your employer, your supervisor, your teacher and your assessor? And do you think it's reasonable to have to be that one person? That is where we find ourselves in general practice training. This year, for the second year running, GP training has been undersubscribed, which tells us that doctors are turning up their noses at this rewarding and critically valuable career pathway. One of the contributing factors, we think, is the inequity in training contracts between general practice and other specialties. And to continue providing safe, high-quality general practice training, something needs to change. As a registrar in general practice, you must actively seek a new job every six months. You must renegotiate a contract every six months. And with the breakdown of communication between the registrar and supervisor associations, there's fewer guidelines around that negotiation. The same person you negotiate your contract with often then becomes your teacher, your trainer, your mentor, and at times your assessor who can affect your progression through training. Along with these challenges, there's the practicalities that I've mentioned of a new employer every six months, including no access to paid maternity leave, restrictions on sick and annual leave balances. These industrial benefits can't be improved under the current framework of employment. And the feeling of inequity will be further amplified when the National Rural Generalist Training Pathway commences, which will offer duration of training contracts. We also must remember that registrars are in training their focus, particularly in the early terms of their training, should be on learning. And our current model that incentivises patient throughput to maximise income is in direct conflict with this training goal. To those of you in the room who are supervisors, we hear your concerns about the difficulties in balancing those employment and educator roles and the burden that frequent trainee changeover has on your practices as well. Of course, in negotiation of any new model, we would need to ensure that neither the registrar, the supervisor, nor the practice loses out financially. And, but we're confident that we can come up with a single employer model where practices have some streamlined HR processes and are also financially not worse off. It's not clear yet what the model will look like, but there is an appetite for change, and we recognise that increased funding will be required. So I ask you, National Conference delegates, to support the motion that we advocate for a single duration of training contract for general practice registrars. Together, we can improve and protect employment conditions for GP registrars and support supervisors in accepting the challenges of providing training. We, as the profession, need to own and lead this change. Hi everybody, my name is Marco, I'm from Queensland, I'm here to help. Um, <laughs> uh, colleagues, look, it, it's with great pleasure that I speak to you today on this motion. I, I am a proud rural generalist and GP registrar in country Queensland. Um, and uh, having seen the benefits of both models, um, I, I'm very proud to speak in support of this motion for um, a single employer model for GP trainees. I'd like you to imagine this. Um, you're a GP in a busy rural area. You see a patient in the ED at 3 a.m., stabilise them, have them retrieved. You also work in your local residential aged care facility. The next morning, you see 15 patients there. You then decide, I've had enough, and I want to have a, my well-earned and deserved three weeks off. Um, under the current document governing registrar employment, and I use this term governing lightly as it's more of a set of guidelines um, that's difficult to enforce in a private practice setting, um, overall you'll be paid precisely zero dollars for all this on-call work as your billings will be rolled into your three-month average and you'll only receive your minimum guaranteed wage under the NTCER, which is currently for a GPT-1 registrar, $2,897 a fortnight before tax. General practice in Australia is hurting. The Medicare rebate freeze and the phasing out of practice incentive payments has led to practices looking to save costs where they can, and understandably so. General practice registrars work and negotiate their employment conditions mindful of this context. 
GP registrars face a power differential in contract negotiations that does not exist with their fellow GP colleagues nor with their specialty registrar colleagues. They have less choice about the practice, circumstances and hours in which they work. Um, they're in a situation where they need a job for their training and learning as opposed to wanting a job. And on this basis, it is difficult for many registrars to negotiate conditions above and beyond the NTCER. Um, this leaves GP registrars in a position where they often have to take a pay cut of 10 to 20% on the first year salary of a hospital registrar. They're not always entitled to on-call, overtime or recall payments. As an equity issue, paid and accrued leave that my colleagues in hospital settings are able to access, including sick leave, accrued annual leave and parental leave, do not exist in general practice training. Um, Recently, required moves between practices have left us unable to accrue this leave, and we have no benefit of union representation by bodies such as ASMOF. The Queen, we, so how can we fix this problem, basically? Um, the answer is we don't have to look that far. The Queensland Rural Generalist Pathway, the upcoming National Rural Generalist Pathway, and in fact, general practice training in New Zealand all employ their registrars under single employer models. These GPs are employed either by their state or training organisation and have preservation of their existing leave and benefits. Colleagues, we need to do more to strengthen general practice training. It's the linchpin of our healthcare system and needs to be attractive to the next generation of doctors. This salaried model is not unprecedented, has profound benefits for the welfare and value proposition to GP trainees. We can have our cake and eat it too, and we can do this better by supporting our registrars and retaining existing incentives and payment systems for general practice supervisors. For the future of general practice, and as a matter of equity, I commend this motion to our AMA. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've got a number of speakers. We'll start on microphone one. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you very much, Danielle and Marco. I speak in strong support of this um, motion. I'd just like to tell you about two cases that I've had as a GP. Both of these were female GP registrars that were pregnant. In the first instance, um, the young woman was a, a, sing a single person and uh, she was in her early 30s undergoing GP training, was pregnant and was extremely unwell and had two days of sick leave. She actually required some two months off work, which was all unpaid, and it got to the stage where she actually had to sell the apartment that she was had a mortgage on. She had no um, accumulated sick leave, despite the fact of having several months in the hospital system. She was extremely emotionally distressed, saying, had I have known this, I wouldn't have moved out of the hospital system. A second case whereby uh, a young woman was pregnant and didn't receive any maternity leave whatsoever because there's no paid maternity leave provision and basically said, look, you know, I'm very pleased to be married to a, um, a training, a specialist trainer in the hospital system because at least he gets a few weeks of paternity leave off and we have that sort of ongoing income and that's just not a situation that we should actually be dealing with. I don't think that the registrars in the, in the hospital system understand the level of disparity between um, GP training registrars and non-GP training registrars. And I think Mudcore's comment that it goes down 10% is, um, 10 to 15% is probably light on. For many registrars, it would go down much more than that. Um, there's obviously, a, a, the other issue Danielle alluded to was the throughput you basically paid on your level of throughput. And GPs and private specialists might say, well, that's what we do, but you're fully formed specialists and consultants. You're not in a training position. In what trade or profession would we actually say, you are um, an electrician training, you just wire up as many houses as you can and you'll be paid on that model. I mean, we're essentially um, dumbing down the quality of this for a throughput model that's incentivised. And there's obviously a disparity in power that was alluded to in that small framing. This is an opportunity because training is moving over to the RACGP next year and I think that the AMA need to make a very strong stand on that and I think that this, this, um, this motion actually supports that. And 
finally, I'd like to say to the GPs that might have some concerns about this, and I can understand that, their concerns about, well, the GP registrars will end up making more money than me, or how can we pay for that as GPs, I absolutely take your point on. However, we can't allow GP registrars to go through this just because we went through this. We need to think about what's right, and we need different models, which have been alluded to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker two at, at microphone one, is that you, Harry? Oh. Um, and then, then we'll go over to the other oh, okay. side. Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, I, I'm a GP, GP uh, supervisor and I'm speaking against it, the motion. Um, there's a number of reasons why I'm doing that. Um, first of all, I've got two registrars and they're fantastic. And we get on like a house on fire. This is my second year as a GP super, registrar supervisor, and I love it. Um, I, so I spoke with one of our, they're doing their OSCEs, their GPT3. Today. One of today. them is doing it today, in the fact. Exam is today. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so I spoke to one of my GP registrars yesterday, and he, uh, the day before yesterday, and he was against it the concept because he'd earn less. Um, he earns grosses currently around about 300000 and the take home, I don't know, something around one fifty, and then he's got sick leave and all the rest of it, the soup and so forth. Now, if he was to get the pay, the base rate, as you've heard, it's pretty poor. But most, most would have earned well above the base rate. I'm all in favour of portability of leave entitlements, but I think that we need to look at a different model. My concern is, number one, there'll be less chance for them to learn about item numbers and how to achieve a decent income, because the business of general practice is a small business and it's a business. Number two, the, the portability issue is very, very important and we just need to look at a model where they, those portability rights can occur. But one of the problems we have is government. Government doesn't like to increase salaries. My prediction is there would be a significant reduction in the salary that a GP registrar could earn if we put it over to the one employer contract. I'm in favour of portability of all of those rights that have been spoken about, but I'm very concerned about putting it all in the hands of the government. Okay, thank you. Um We'll now take a couple of speakers from microphone two, and could you please say your names for the purposes of the minutes? My name's Roz, sorry about my voice. I'm a GP registrar in Western Australia, GPT1, and medicine is degree number five for me. I've been around, I've worked in a variety of different careers, and coming out of hospital as a GPT5, or sorry, as a uh, PGY5 into GP, I've undergone a significant, a 25,000 a year pay cut. A GP reg, full time, earns 75,000 as a GPT-1. I'm pregnant, I'm about to have my second child, I choose to work part time, and I commend the AMA for what they've done in terms of raising Medicare rebates, but I must speak in forward to this motion. It is not acceptable in this day and age to have the inequality for women and for other GP regs who have to change employers, who have to negotiate with their boss, who is their supervisor, as was said, it is really disempowering as a junior doctor, and I am one that is not afraid to speak up. So I would really like to encourage everyone to speak, uh, to vote in, for motion, in favour of this motion. I appreciate the concerns raised by the previous speaker, but there are other ways around it, and we need a way to ensure that women and men can do GP. The number of people doing GP or not doing GP because they hear about the pay cut is huge. And as a reg registrar liaison officer, P 
people are say to me, oh, what's the pay like? And when I tell them what the base rate is, they go, I cannot survive on that. We are postgraduates. We've got multiple degrees and they, it's not a step backwards. And as a result, places are not being filled and juniors are not wanting to step out of the hospital. We want work-life balance, but at what cost? And I don't think that we should have to pay the cost to our families because of it. Thank you. Uh, another speaker at microphone two, and your name, please, for the minutes. Uh, John Woodall, um, Rural Representative for South Australia and a uh, committee member of the Rural Strategy um, Workforce. Um, at a recent workshop of that uh, South Australian Rural Strategy Workforce, I think it um, focused on the patient and uh, a patient issue for somebody in rural South Australia is that there's a dearth of GP registrars and GPs. I commend Danielle and her group for putting this um, policy debate, this draft motion forward, and I urge those present to support it for the interest of those in rural and remote Australia. Thank you. We'll go to microphone one and we'll take the next two speakers from microphone one. Thanks, Bev. I'm Mark Horshard from Western Australia. Um, I think we have to be a little bit uh, realistic here about what we're talking about. Uh, I'm in support of the motion, by the way. But uh, if, there's, if we think there's a, a lovely, deep pile of money that's going to magically appear from government to increase the salaries of any of our members, uh, we're dreaming. So I think we need to separate the issues. What we're talking about in my mind is a human rights issue. Uh, every trainee should have equal access to maternity leave, sick leave, etc. And the advantage of a single um, employer model is that that will be guaranteed. Will it be more money in the pockets of GP registrars? For some it might, but for many it won't. And I understand in the past, like all good ideas, this isn't new, in the past GPRA has not been supportive of going down this pathway because of I pre presume the potential to reduce income. But let's put that aside and remember that, um, and it's not just GP registrars, by the way, we've currently got an orthopaedic registrar in the ACT who's had to go to the Industrial Commission to try and get maternity leave because of exactly the same issue, changing employers. So we need to do better um, and uh, separate the money from the conditions. I strongly support this motion and I think we need to look at uh, rolling it out to all our other types of uh, trainees as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Jim Finn, um, delegate from Queensland and the State Secretary of ASMO of Q. May I uh, speak in very much in support of this motion? Um, we all know that there's a power imbalance between registrars and the employer. A collective bargain done by a professional negotiating team um, in affiliation with the AMA is the best way forward. 15 years ago, I was one of the GPRA negotiators for the national terms and conditions, and the gentleman standing behind me was the negotiator for the supervisors, and he taught me a valuable lesson, that old age and cunning beat youth exuberance and a bad haircut any day. <laughs> so to, to go up against gentlemen like this, we need a professional negotiating team. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And um, we'll go to microphone two for the next two speakers. Yeah, thank you. Um, Danny Byrne, GP in, in uh, Adelaide. Um, been GP supervisor for about 20 years. Um, at my first reading of the motion up there, I thought, no bloody way. Um, but then hearing the, the young speakers uh, talk about the portability issues of the sick leave and the maternity leave, etc., holiday leave, I wasn't um, actually aware of that, uh, that fine nuance. Um, but the most, well, for me, the most important thing is that last line, while at the same time meeting the needs of supervising practices. It's pretty simple. It's really just mathematics. Income comes in and a certain proportion can, can go, go out. Whether, you know, if you're a contractor, it's X. If you're a registrar, it's Y. And uh, at the end of the day, you, know, you can't get money out of a stone. To me, this just... Uh, a reflection of the low GP rebates, the freeze, etc. Um, I can remember in 2006, 
a GP registrar was paid higher than a hospital registrar and we're just flooded with applications. Um, so hopefully the, the pendulum swings when uh, the income and remuneration for general practice gets back to where it should be. Um, but as it reads, I think I'll vote yes um, so that there can be further, further discussion. But there's some nuances around it because um, at the end of the day, it's a fee-for-service uh, landscape. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker at microphone two. Uh, Jeff Dobb from the Council of Public Hospital Doctors and also the national president of ASMOF. Uh, ASMOF has reached out to GPRA to offer assistance in the negotiations uh, uh, that they, they have. And uh, at the moment, we are not fully engaged with them we would like to be. I support this concept for the reasons that have been outlined. Um, the, there is clearly a need to develop under this proposal a, an award under the uh, federal jurisdiction. Uh, and there is the expertise within ASMOF and the AMA uh, to negotiate such an award. I believe that it would be of national benefit, make a career in general practice more rewarding. Uh, and assist the, with the portability of benefits. Uh, I would also like to point out that it's not just uh, GP registrars who can lose their benefits. And in most of the jurisdictions in Australia, if you move during your training from one jurisdiction to another, again, you lose benefits such as sick leave uh, and, and uh, parental leave. So uh, the AMA president, Tony Bartoni, and myself have now written on two occasions uh, to RMAC, asking them to address this uh, as a national priority. So I do support the motion. All right. Thank you. Uh, microphone one. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks, Jim, for his kind welcome. My name's Ian Kammerman. I was formerly president of the GP Supervisors Association, also president of the Royal Doctors Association of Australia. I'd like to thank Danielle and Marco for their uh, draft motion, and I speak positively in support of it very strongly. At the moment, we have a crisis. Well, we've got a series of crises approaching uh, medicine in Australia and healthcare. We've got uh, decreasing numbers of uh, general practitioners, increasing numbers of non-GP specialists, which means increased expenditure for healthcare in Australia. And I realise that I'm talking to a group that does include non-GP specialists, but that also doesn't necessarily equate to increased health outcomes. The problem is at the moment that we have a collapse in GP registrar numbers. People are choosing not to join general practice and one of the barriers is income. GP practices are under significant stress as far as recruitment and retaining their doctors, the Medicare freeze, the increasing costs and requirements of running a practice. We've always tried to support registrar wages as much as possible, but we're looking at a very limited high in which to share. My feelings very much are is that registrars would be much better served by a single employer contract with a single employer such as one of the jurisdictions of the federal government along with every other medical trainee within Australia. By doing so we would remove one of the barriers to uh, doctors choosing general practice as a career. My one word of warning, I suppose, is that it also might progress to salaries for GPs downstream, because, of course, we're going to end up with a registrar population who are used to certain terms and conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another speaker at microphone one, and there'll be just time for one last speaker at microphone two. Thank Gio you. Pecoraro, board chair from Queensland. I'm in favour of this. Um, I would like the, perhaps the DITS committee to come back 
with a broader one next time that looks at all registrars. We've got a situation in Queensland in obstetrics and gynaecology where the major employer is a church-run hospital and if you do three years there and you go to a state-run hospital, your um, parental leave, your sick leave, nothing transfers over. So I liked what the previous speaker said about perhaps a national way of looking at registrar contracts so that you don't lose hard fought for entitlements if you move between sectors and hospitals, but absolutely in favour of this one. Thank you. A microphone two. Um, thank you, Richard Kidd. I'm the chair of the AMA Council of General Practice. I suppose I'll just uh, reiterate everything that Innes said and that many others have said. It's very simple for me to just say the current system is broken, it's really unfair, and we have to fix it. And this looks like really the only way we can fix it, so I'm strongly supportive. Okay, all right, well thank you. We'll close off debate and uh, the motion is uh, on the screen and uh, voting should be open in short order that our AMA recommends the government develop a single, single employer model as an alternative to fee-for-service arrangements to deliver equitable remuneration and employment conditions for re GP registrars and between GP registrars and non-GP registrars while at the same time meeting the needs of supervising practices. That's the longest 30 seconds I've ever experienced. Are we ready to, <laughs> is that uh, ready? Okay, so the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll invite uh, Professor Elliott to the podium. Uh, she moves the motion related to alcohol use in pregnancy. Thank you. For centuries, we've known about the harms of alcohol use in pregnancy, but the term fetal alcohol syndrome was not coined till 1973 to describe children born to alcoholic women with fetal abnormalities, microcephaly and birth defects. Alcohol exposure at any time in pregnancy can cause brain injury, resulting in the severe neurodevelopmental impairment that characterises fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or FASD. As medical students in the 70s, we were taught nothing about alcohol in pregnancy. As a trainee, I learned that alcohol is teratogenic, that it crosses the placenta, and I saw my first cases of FASD. As a paediatrician in 2019, I'm acutely aware of this devastating disorder. We estimate that up to 5% of general Australian population has FASD. Paediatricians reported nearly 400 new cases to the Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit in a recent three-year period. In remote Aboriginal Australia, we found that 20% of children have this diagnosis and 36% of children in juvenile detention in Western Australia have FASD. But the harms from prenatal alcohol exposure extend way beyond FASD. Alcohol causes miscarriage, prematurity, stillbirth, low birth weight and birth defects. It puts children at increased risk of SIDS, cerebral palsy, language delay, poor academic outcomes. Through epigenetic mechanisms, it alters the expression of genes involved in neurodevelopment and it predisposes to long-term cardiovascular and renal outcomes. Yet all these harms are preventable. In Australia, we have clear national guidelines recommending that the safest option for women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy is to avoid alcohol use. Can we then assume that women no longer drink in pregnancy and that all clinicians provide the right advice? The answer is no. WHO data say that Australia's drinking rate in pregnancy is amongst the highest in the world. The 2016 National Household Survey show that half of the women drink in during pregnancy, a quarter throughout pregnancy. In remote WA, 55% of Aboriginal women drink alcohol in pregnancy, 
but over 90% of these at very risky levels. But alcohol use in pregnancy is not an indigenous issue. In our low-risk pregnancy cohort studies in Victoria, New South Wales, and Newcastle, 60% of women report drinking in pregnancy, 20% binge drinking in the first trimester. Considering that 50% of pregnancies in Australia are unplanned, these figures are of concern. What's more, fewer than half of doctors who see pregnant women routinely ask about alcohol use, and 10% never ask. Some say they don't know how to ask, don't have time, don't know what to advise. Some fear angering or stigmatising women, promoting anxiety and damaging the doctor-patient relationship. 87% are not aware of the national guidelines. Few provide advice about potential harms or recognise that no safe level of alcohol intake in pregnancy has or ever will be established. On the other hand, women tell us that they're rarely asked about alcohol and receive inconsistent advice from their doctors. In our national survey, most said that health professionals were their preferred, preferred source, of, source of information. Over 90% of women said they wanted to be asked and advised about alcohol use in pregnancy. Over 95% said they wanted to be advised to abstain from alcohol. The AMA's 2012 position statement on alcohol consumption and harms says that the best advice for women who are pregnant is not to consume alcohol because there is no scientific consensus on a threshold below which adverse effects on the fetus do not occur. The AMA's 2016 statement on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder recommends that measures be taken to increase clinician awareness of alcohol harms to facilitate conversations with patients about alcohol consumption during pregnancy. Neither explicitly recommend advising that women avoid alcohol. So in summary, clinicians can have a crucial role in preventing harms, but don't provide advice consistent with national guidelines. And I propose that the AMA move that clinicians should advise women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy that the safest option is to avoid alcohol. The seconder is reserving. Yes, thank you. All right, speakers to the microphones, please. And we'll start with microphone two. Thank you. Um, um, Richard and state Kidd. your name for the yes. minutes. Thank yep. you, Richard. Uh, Richard Kidd, Chair of AMA CGP. Um, I'm strongly supportive of this motion and really quite saddened that this motion is necessary at this time. Um, in 2014, the AMA was strongly involved in the um, fair launch of the Women Want to Know campaign and we uh, developed um, a, a range of resources in collaboration with all the other peak bodies and fair to um, educate all of our colleagues on this very point. So it's very sad that five years later there's still such a disparity between what we should know and what we should say and what's happening. Thanks Richard. Any other speakers? All right, well, we'll now put the motion, which is on the screen, that the AMA support NHMRC guidelines that clinicians should advise women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy that the safest option is to avoid alcohol entirely based on the information that prenatal alcohol exposure may harm the unborn child and that no safe level has been established for alcohol consumption in pregnancy. Okay, um, well, the motion is carried, thank you. Uh, we turn now to the fourth policy topic. Introducing targets for rural research funding and facilities, moved by Dr. Solyndra. Come to this podium, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present this motion. So. I would say, in my view, in terms of medical research, and although many of you are probably engaged in it, I think the key three aspects that medical research can bring 
for us is that obviously, firstly, improving patient care. So whether that's measuring patient outcomes or whether it's improving access to clinical trials, medical research is central to our ability to improve patient care. Secondly, of course, contributing to the global body of medical knowledge and to progress our profession and to the benefit of all humanity is of course also important. And third, I would say that it is a key component of our education and training processes and of course our career advancement in medicine. So to this end, I put to you that the NHMRC, our peak body for medical research in Australia, in the 15 years between the year 2000 and 2015, spent less than 1% of its funding on funding rural health research. Less than 1%. They distribute around $943 million worth of funds every year. Similarly, $1.7 billion was spent on medical research by the Medical Research Future Fund in, to date, and yet not $1 was spent on rural health out of that $1.7 billion. I would say that rural patients now account for 30% of all Australians, so being regional, rural and remote Australians. We know that they have experienced poorer health outcomes and more challenges to accessing health care. And so it seems simple to me that we should be streamlining our ability to provide research funding for rural health. Similarly, when we look at training and rural health training programs, a recent study published just last week in the BMJ found that registrars and pre-vocational trainees place significant um, importance on the access to performing research. And with our increased amount of training occurring in rural areas, they foresee the lack of rural research opportunities as being a barrier to training in rural areas. And similarly, rural clinicians see this as a less attractive pathway because they do not have access to having an academic career in medicine. So, I would strongly urge you today to support this motion as a potential solution to rectify this inequitable access to research and all the medical benefits that it brings. By partnering with established research groups and facilities and linking them to rural centres, I hope that we can improve the patient outcomes and benefits to, to all of our patients collectively. In addition to that, I would say by having something such as a mandatory target for funding, in all of those millions and billions of dollars that we're spending, that this would help to improve access for all clinicians um, interested in rural research and to hopefully bolster our rural research um, training programs. Thank you. Um, now this is seconded by Chris Zapala. Um, Chris, are you wanting, you're reserving? Okay. Could the speakers go to the microphones please? And we'll, Start with microphone two, because I'm looking straight at you. Thank you. Um, my name is Andreas. I'm a second year doctor from um, Bansdale in East Gippsland. It's my first time attending this national conference. We have had the Monash Clinical Schools in East Gippsland cut in funding. Two research fellows, one of whom was unfortunately released from his position. I was intending to do research into impacts of opioid analgesia in a primary care setting and was told that there was not enough funding and that I should approach the hospital instead, who obviously are using their money for staff members and locums because we're short-staffed. I think it's absolutely true that we need research in a rural setting just as much as we do in a metropolitan setting, whether they be primarily pharmaceutical or sociological or um, in any other areas. And yes, there should be a quota for that funding and yes, there are many pre-vocational doctors like myself who would be interested in that research, but are unable to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, microphone two. Hello, Marco Giuseppe, GP registrar from Chinchilla in Queensland. Um, I speak strongly in favour of this motion. Um, as a GP registrar currently attempting to do research in a rural area myself, I have a lived experience of how horrendous it can be. Um, and it speaks to research infrastructure as well as funding. Um, so for example, in rural hospitals, um, ethics committees are often less experienced and less likely to actually approve your applications because they're not as familiar as some larger institutional committees are. Um, and in addition, actually obtaining funding for research is quite difficult as there is a perception 
uh, particularly in metropolitan settings, that rural research is actually quite low yield when in fact the converse is true. It's actually a complete greenfield area for most topics research-wise. It provides an excellent opportunity for pre-vocational and vocational doctors in training to actually advance their careers, network and um, actually contribute to a body of research in an area of medicine that they are interested in. So overall, I think that this is something that is a long time coming and I strongly um, recommend to my colleagues that this motion be supported. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go to microphone one for the next two speakers, please. Uh, Annette Newson, Rural General Practitioner. Um, I'd like to support this motion for three reasons. One, the biggest issue we're dealing with in rural areas is resource allocation. All the money is going to locums, as our young speaker just said. We desperately researched to work out where resource allocation needs to go. Secondly, um, one of the major disincentives to coming rural is spousal employment. People cannot get work in universities outside of the metropolitan areas. This would create another wonderful opportunity to get two specialists to an area. And thirdly, Shanaz, who recommended this, is a product of research done in the United States, which actually recommended to train students for an entire year in, the, um, in a rural area. And uh, she was my student, and I'm delighted to see what she's doing now. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, uh, Steve Robson from Canberra. I just want to start with two conflicts. I want to declare I am a paid committee member on the NHMRC, and I'm also a dreaded academic, so don't judge me too harshly. I think it's absolutely critical that the generalizability of um, RCT results and things is really compromised by the um, population of subjects who are involved in the research and of course most institutions do or um, recruit people to studies because they're, they're cheap and they're close and they're not necessarily generating uh, results that are generalisable to other locations even from the point of view of resourcing recommendations that might come out of clinical trials they're actually harder to implement so I would strongly 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 uh, uh, support this I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think we're back to microphone two. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth Elliott, I'm an academic paediatrician and also a, uh, an NHMRC practitioner fellow, and I'm strongly supportive of the notion that there's increased research funding, particularly for rural and remote communities. But I'm not actually clear what uh, sort of mechanism is proposed here. What is uh, a rural funding scheme? So I, I think that we need to explore with the NHMRC the opportunities for uh, funding to, to remote and rural areas. So it may be, for example, that there, are, there is targeted research funding allocated rather than having to people, people to have to compete in the, the current scheme. And I think also aligned with this, we really need to promote training of research skills uh, for people working in rural and remote areas. Thank you. Uh, microphone one. Thank you very much. Ines Rio, GP, who works very inner um, metro, and I'm strongly supportive of this. I think that it provides um, an opportunity to decrease the inequities in healthcare in rural settings. I think it also has the opportunity to actually improve the workforce model and the male distribution of, um, of medical practitioners in the country, because it, again, it provides them another avenue of, um, of work and capacity building. I also think it's, that's the sort of first parameter. The other issue is that I think it speaks to the fact that the NHMRC, and I was very pleased to see that somebody was here from the NHMRC, um, makes their decisions and the allocation of resources based on need and where the opportunities are for improvement. So it actually, um, in another version of, of a draft motion, would support something where there's a minimum amount of NHMRC funding that goes to primary care and general practice research, as there is in um, the UK. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, no more speakers to that motion. Uh, then we'll open voting. Uh, that AMA calls on the National Health and Medical Research Council to introduce a rural research funding scheme for health and medical research.
Okay, is 30 seconds up? <laughs> oh, all right, thank you. Uh, so the motion is carried. Thank you. All right, well, that uh, concludes the first session of policy debates, and uh, it's a, an art, not a science, getting the right number of topics uh, into a session. So uh, uh, thank you to all of those who contributed. Uh, it does mean we're moving earlier on the program to um, our address from uh, Dr. Penny Brown, Chief Medical Officer of Avant. So Penny, um, in this role, uh, Penny advises the CEO and senior management team at Avant on clinical matters as well as leading the research, education and advocacy team. She also works as senior staff specialist in general practice unit at the Hornsby Hospital in New South Wales and she has a long career in general practice education. She developed her medical e medico legal interests during her membership of the Medical Experts Committee at Avant in 2000. She then completed a Master's in Health Law at Sydney Uni and has worked as a medical advisor supporting doctors with complaints and claims from 2008 until she began the current role in 2015. Welcome, Penny. And thank you all for having me and I'm would like to first of all acknowledge President Tony Bartoni and Deputy President Chris Sapala and all the members of the AMA for having us here. I'm very pleased to be with you again and to say a few words in this pre-lunch spot. I will be brief and let you get to lunch. Um, I, uh, I addressed last year's conference in Canberra and spoke of an issue that was very concerning to Avant and to our members and I'll just recap that was in relation to a decision by the Medical Board and APRA to publish all tribunal judgments on the register of practitioners, including those that had no adverse findings made against the practitioner, and to keep those decisions on the register forever. I understand that the regulators have a desire for transparency, but as I said at the time, when the judgment states that the allegations were not proven, what possible reason could there be for the judgment to be linked to the register? Well, the issue that we raised that day struck a chord with many in the profession. You may all recall that one doctor, a Dr. Steele, a Scott, started an online petition which resulted in over 15,000 signatures, demonstrating the depth of passion that the profession had about this issue. And pleasingly, in response, the Medical Board and APRA changed their position and agreed to not link the decisions to the register where there was no adverse finding. And that was the right thing to do. However, the issue of keeping tribunal judgments on the register forever, nothing has moved. Let me just take you there. Let's have a little thought. Imagine it's you or me that's been through the stress of tribunal hearing for something like prescribing issues. And finally, the findings are that some of the allocations are proven and you receive a reprimand. It's over. You rehabilitate, you attend courses, and you change your practice, and you move on with your life, or do you? Every time you apply for a job, the employer takes this issue into account. And unexpectedly, every few months, a patient looks at the APRA registrar and raises the issue with you. You feel defensive and re-traumatised, and that's the word I use deliberately, every time it comes up. Let's go back to where this change in policy by APRA and the Medical Board has come from. You may recall that the decision to include the links was in response to Professor Ron Patterson's independent review of the use of chaperones to protect patients in Australia. And his review was concerned the use of chaperones for sexual boundary violations. And while he recommended more information be available on the register for reasons of greater transparency, it was in the context 
of allegations of sexual boundary violations. And in fact, Professor Patterson confirmed this when he was recently speaking at the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities in Dubai last year. So let me just come to the point here. Avant very strongly believes that when judgments are made that have no relation to sexual boundary violations, and provided there have been no further issues, then the links to the, on the register should be removed after five years. How can it be fair that many years before that has no relation to a doctor's current practice or conditions to remain linked to the register forever? It is not fair and it is punitive. I am aware that the AMA has also raised issues pointing out that there are spent conviction provisions for certain class of criminal convictions so that convictions are removed from a person's criminal record after 10 years. Publication of adverse disciplinary decision, decisions which will remain on the upper register forever could be seen as more draconian than what occurs in the criminal sphere. Advanced core role as a medical defence organisation is to protect and support doctors in the face of a claim or complaint. But as I said yesterday, one of our major and ongoing concerns is the significant impact that the complaint process has on our practitioners. This conference has spent a lot of time focusing on the vital importance of doctors' health and well-being. It really is wrong for these judgments to remain in perpetuity on the register as it has both professional and personal impacts that last well beyond the time that it takes to finalise the complaint. We will continue to work to reduce the effect that the complaints process has on our doctors. Having a medical workforce that is valued and supported is good for patients, it's good for practitioners, and it's good for the Australian community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny, for another, you know, the, the battle never ceases. Um, we'll break now for lunch. I think we're a little early, and uh, that's a, a wonderful situation for us to be in. Could you be back here by 1.30 for the second of the policy debate sessions? And as I've mentioned, uh, we will have to start those dead on time. Thank you.